Chapter 15 Bearer of Sacred Blood Malus had been in the saddle for three hours before dawn, riding from barracks to barracks across the Black Ark and readying the army for war. It had been a long, sleepless night, filled with a hectic procession of introductions, assessment and orders, many of which had to be delivered forcefully and in person in order to actually get the companies moving in the proper direction. There had been little time for the news of Bale's new appointments to filter down to the rest of the ranks in the wake of the council, and few captains were prepared to believe that he, of all people, had the authority he claimed. One particular fool had even gone so far as to call him a liar and laugh in his face. Fortunately, his lieutenant had proven much more circumspect, after malice fed the captain to spite. Dawn was paling the sky, and it looked to be a clear, cold day, as Malus sat in the saddle beside the household knights in the sprawling square of the great gate. Of all the divisions in the army, the knights had been the easiest to organize and the hardest to command. With their own small army of retainers, the knights could pack and be ready to move at a moment's notice, but convincing them of the need to do so was a tricky business. After almost an hour of bickering over pride of place in the ranks, Malus had lost patience and simply delegated the job to Lord Tenukir, who was far more familiar with the peculiarities of the Ark's nobility. He hadn't seen Tenukir for the rest of the night, but shortly before dawn, the first knights began filtering into the square, and within half an hour the entire division was arrayed in columns before the gate, the pennons on their gleaming lances snapping in the brisk wind. The first division of foot followed shortly afterwards, marching by company into the square and halting in columns a safe distance away from the sluggish and sullen Noglir. The rest of the army was well out of sight, stretching along more than two miles of roadway that wound like a snake among the towers of the Ark. Malus had ridden from one end to the other and back again, checking with the other captains to ensure that the divisions were formed and ready for inspection according to Fuerlan's orders and, by some miracle, they had done it. The highborn leaned back in the saddle and studied the sky. As near as he could reckon, Fuerlan was an hour late. A heavy tread across the cobblestones of the square brought Malus's head around. Lord Galefan trotted down the rank of knights towards Malus, riding a huge cold one, almost as old and scarred as he was. Spite growled in warning at the giant Noglir, and Malus jerked Spite's rein with a warning of his own. Gelfan reined in at a respectful distance and raised his hand in salute. Lord Esrahel sends his greetings, my lord. He says that there's no way the baggage train will be ready to move before mid-afternoon at the earliest. Blessed mother of night, Malus cursed wearily. The fighting divisions of the army wouldn't be clear of the city until mid-morning as it was, but that would still leave the artillery and supplies as many as six hours behind the rest of the force. What's the problem? The old knight leaned over and spat on the cobblestones. The leaders of the Draughtman's Guild decided to hold out for more coin, said they couldn't provide enough wagons and oxen on such short notice. And he didn't make an example out of these thieving wretches, Malus snorted. Of course, but it does take time to crucify twenty men. Once Ezrahel had everything sorted, it was well into the night. They're just trying to catch up at this point. Damnation, Malus growled, his sword hand clenching in a fist. Do you think Ezrahel truly has things in hand, or does he need to be replaced? Galefan gave Malus a sidelong glance with his one good eye. Not wise to replace one of the Witch Lord's appointments, especially before the armies even marched. I couldn't care less about politics, Malus snapped. Victory is what I'm after. So, does Ezrahel know what he's doing? Galefan gave the highborn a searching look and then grinned. Aye, my lord, he does. He has had a bad throw of the bones and is trying to make the best of it, but he'll come through. Malus let out a loud sigh. Then mid-afternoon it is, he said. It's not as though we'll be making camp in the next three days. 
Suddenly it occurred to him that he hadn't checked to be sure each of the companies was carrying enough food and water on their back to last them through the march. He grimaced. Galvan, I got a job for you. Before he could continue, Malice heard someone else calling his name across the square. The highborn looked over to see Lord Elufir riding towards him with a cloth-wrapped bundle across his lap. Malice gathered his reins and turned back to the scarred knight. Check with the company captains, and make certain we've got enough rations for the next three days. They carry what they eat, or they'll go without. Understood? A weary look passed across the knight's face, but he answered without hesitation. Understood, my lord, he said, and healed his mount around for yet another errand for his master. Elufir arrived as Gilfan rode off. The younger knight's mount was smaller than the older retainers, but it was still a third again as big as Spite. The smaller Nauglir tried to sidle away from the newcomer, but Malus checked the motion with a touch of his spurs. What have you got for me? the highborn asked. Hot bread, cheese, and some sausage, Elufir said triumphantly, passing the bundle to his lord, and then reached back and pulled an earthenware jar from a saddlebag and carefully opened the lid. When he pulled the lid away, a spiral of steam curled up from the dark liquid within. And I had one of the men boil a pot of Ithrum, he said triumphantly. Ithrum? It's a drink made from boiled corva root, Elufir explained. Don't they have this in Hoggrave? Malus frowned. Certainly not. It sounds disgusting. Oh, it does taste truly vile, I'll give you that, Elufir said with a grin. But it will banish sleep and keep your wits sharp for hours. He offered Malus the jar. I thought you could find it useful. The highborn eyed the jar suspiciously. For all I know, this could be poison. To his surprise, Elufir laughed. Oh, it is poison, all right, Elufir said. Necessary poison, but poison all the same. Just then, Malus felt a jaw-cracking yawn come, and then reached for the jar. He took a tentative sip, jerking back as the scalding liquid bit his lips. Gods below, he said with a pained expression. Bitter as a temple maiden's heart. After a moment, he took a real sip. The taste was just as vile but he was grateful for the warmth that filled his belly. Malus unfolded a bundle in his lap and began wolfing down the food, realizing he hadn't eaten a bite all day long. Any sign of Werlan? he asked between mouthfuls. Elufir took a long drink from the jar. Malus wasn't certain if the man's grimace was from the drink or his opinion of the army's commander. Word is that he did a tour of the flesh houses last night, and wound up sprawled on the steps of the local temple sometime past midnight. He's been inside ever since. Malus finished the quick meal and wiped away the crumbs from the front of his chiton, and then his weary mind registered the fact that he was not wearing armor. He didn't even have a sword to call his own. May the outer darkness take me, he growled. Everyone's ready for war but me. He turned to Elufir. Have you any idea where Lady Nagaira is? Your sister? Of course, my sister. Who else? Elufir blinked at his lord. Isn't that her over there? He asked, indicating a knot of riders entering the side of the square. Malus followed the man's gesturing hand and saw a hooded figure astride a powerful black warhorse accompanied by a pair of armored cavalrymen and what appeared to be a small retinue of mounted servants. He couldn't tell if the figure was Nagaira or not, but he certainly had no idea who else it could be. He kicked Spite into a trot and moved to intercept the small party. The horses of the group turned skittish when they caught a scent of the assembled cold ones, all except for the black destrier at the lead. Its cold black eyes glared a challenge at Malice and Spite both as they approached, and the highborn couldn't shake the sensation of sorcery about the animal as he drew near. Up close, the hooded figure was indeed a woman. When she turned her head to regard him, Malice saw the gleam of silver steel beneath the shadow of the voluminous hood. 
Well met, brother, Nagaira said, her voice muffled slightly behind an ornately worked mask made in the shape of a leering demon. The army is arrayed in fearsome order. You have done well. And yet I look like a poor knight squire before the battle, he said sourly. Where are my swords and armor? You said they were being tended to. Nagaira raised her hand and two retainers slid from their mounts without a word and began pulling wooden boxes from the backs of their horses. I have not forgotten, she said, sounding amused. The armorer said that the plate was of inferior quality, so I commissioned him to take another harness and alter it to suit. A good thing I know your measurements so well, is it not? Malice didn't know whether to be grateful, a galling thought in and of itself, or outraged. Such generous gifts, sister, he said. Won't your betrothed grow jealous? Oh, I'm not paying for these, brother, she said. I told the armorer that you have been appointed as the army's captain of knights, and he was more than happy to extend you credit. Credit, Malice cried. Now you put me into debt. Be still, Nagara snapped. Climb down off that stinking creature and put the armor on. Fuerlan will be here any moment now. Malus was halfway out of the saddle before his half-sister's words even registered on his sleep-deprived brain. He saw the witch's bodyguards share a surprised glance at his unquestioning reaction and swallowed an angry rebuke. A confrontation with Nagara at this juncture would just make things worse, and if Werlan was indeed on the way, he didn't have a lot of time. He stepped away from the mount, and two servants set the boxes containing the armor down beside him. The pair went to work smoothly and skillfully, quickly buckling and lacing the overlapping plates onto the chiton. He glared angrily at his sister. You've grown presumptuous since you left the hag, he said coldly. A trait you picked up from your betrothed, no doubt. Don't be stupid, Malus, Nagaira said. I don't have the time for it. There's enough to be done without your foolish ego getting in the way. The outrage was so extravagant it made Malus's jaw drop. His face went white with rage, so much so that the men arming him took a step back, and they were careful not to get between the two siblings. However, he did not move. No words of rebuke rose to his lips. Nagaira met his stare unflinchingly, and after a moment the servants resumed their work. What's the matter with me? Malus thought, gold to the core at his inability to lash out at his sister. Did a fever sap my courage instead of my health? He felt another dull ache building in his head, and gritted his teeth against the pain. The servants were done in moments, and one of their number presented Malus with a dragon wing helmet and a fine pair of swords in mashed ebony scabbards. He had just buckled them on when he heard a curious wailing echoing down the street from the north. What in the Dark Mother's name is that? That would be Fuerlan, Nagaira said. Prepare yourself, brother. He is probably still drunk. Cursing under his breath, Malus climbed back onto Spite's back and returned to his place beside the knights. Lord Deluhir took his place at Malus's side, but Gelfan was still not back from the latest mission. Sanishar, Malus bellowed, standing in the stirrups. The warlord approaches. The cry echoed down the line as the company captains called their footmen to attention. A ripple ran through the thicket of spears as the men dressed their lines. The wailing was much louder now. Malus could make out women's voices, crying out a shrill chanting, and then he caught sight of an ornately armored figure riding an enormous cold one striding into the square. Fuerlan swayed slightly in the saddle as the huge Nauglir trumped over the cobblestones. His bald head glistened with streaks of fresh, steaming blood, and he held in his hands a goblet of burnished brass. Behind the war beast danced a procession of naked, blood-streaked women, chanting fiercely at the sky and slicing their flesh with curved daggers made of brass. Mother of night, Malus whispered, appalled at this ostentatious scene. Who does he think he is? 
the spoiled son of Bal of Baal, and the conqueror of Hog Grief, Elothir replied, just as quietly. And mad as a cockatrice these days, he was bad enough before, but his time at Hog Grief changed him for the worse. Elothir glanced at Malus. You're from Hag Grief, my lord. Do you know how he came to get all those scars? Malus shot the young knight a hard glare. He was overly familiar with his betters, the highborn said tersely, and then kicked Spite into a trot. Fuerland's procession was still streaming into the square when Malus met the general midway across the open space. Beside the temple maidens, Malus saw that he had brought a troop of retainers, a multitude of servants, and at least a dozen pack animals, laden with everything from wine to furniture. Biting back his annoyance, he halted his mount and sat to attention, ready to report. The young general glared evilly at Malus and hauled on the reins of the mount, but the old beast tossed its head and snapped at the bridle rings, bellowing in anger. Its tail lashed, whistling through the air like a giant club, until the temple maidens had to stop their chant abruptly and give ground. Fuerlan cursed the animal, spilling thick red fluid from his cup as he alternately kicked and lashed at the beast with his reins. Finally the Nogler subsided, and Fuerlan glared at Malus as if somehow he was to blame. Malus took a deep breath. The army stands ready to march, dread general, he said in a loud, clear voice. We await your order. Did I order you to have them ready to march, you idiot? Fuerlan sneered. I said have them ready for inspection. And so they were, dread general, Malus replied stiffly. An hour before sunrise, as ordered. A shiver of rage racked the blood-soaked prince. Such impertinence, he seethed. You dare mock me? I am merely repeating the orders you gave to me, Malus replied. No impertinence was intended. For a moment, Malus heard Hauglir's face in his head, repeating the same words with a carefully neutral expression on his face. Now I understand the man's infuriating tone, he realized. Liar! Fuerland snapped. I'm gonna have you flogged! As you wish, Dread General. Malus said past clenched teeth. But may I remind you that your father urged the army to make haste, and a proper scourging will cost us hours at best. More impertinence, the general hissed. Rest assured I see through your clumsy artifice. When we make camp I'll have you stripped naked and flayed down to the bone. Very well, Malus replied knowing that they wouldn't be making camp for another three days at least. Do you wish to address the troops before we march? We will not march yet, you mutinous wretch, Fuerlan shouted, leaning forward in the saddle. Malus could smell the wine on the man's breath from fifteen feet away. I said I wanted to inspect the army, and that is what I will do. Mother of night, preserve me, Malus thought, struggling with his anger. Dread general, an inspection will cost us at least an hour of daylight, likely more. Your father... Do not speak to me of my father, you damn kinslayer, Fuerlan sneered. I know full well what he expects of me, just as I know what he expects of you. Malus frowned. What does that mean, he wondered. I will begin by inspecting the scout detachment, Fuerlan declared imperiously. You can't, Malus blurted, taken aback by the statement. Traditionally, scouts weren't even considered part of the proper army. They left the Ark at midnight. Fuerlan's eyes went wide. They left? For what purpose? To scout, what else? Malus snapped, finally losing patience. They can't be out hunting for the enemy if they're here kissing your arse. You, you, Fuerlan stammered, his expression livid. You mutineer, 
I'll have you skinned alive. I'll have your bones broken. I'll tear off your private and stuff them down your throat. Malus smiled at the scarred highborn. The dread general is welcome to try, he said. But he would do well to remember what happened the last time he laid a hand upon me. The word struck Fuerlan like a physical blow. He trembled with animal rage, the goblet shaking in his hand. He snarled like a maddened wolf, reaching for his sword, until a cold voice stopped him in his tracks. My lord is being wasteful with the lord of murder's blessings, Nagaira said from behind Malus. You spill his sacred blood upon the stones, it's an evil omen on the eve of war. Fuerlan paused, his eyes going to the goblet tilted precariously in his grasp. With an effort he righted it and attempted to regain some of his composure. This, this treacherous wretch provoke me, he said, his voice a plaintive whine. He seeks to sabotage my campaign before it's even begun. Slay him, slay him now. Malice stiffened. Fuerlan was one thing, but Nagaira was another matter entirely. His right hand twitched, creeping for the sword, but his sister's voice turned stern as she spoke to the general. I will do nothing of the sort, she snapped. Compose yourself, my lord, and remember all that we discussed. Now is not the time for rash action. Fuerlan started to make a heated reply, and then caught himself as he met Nagaira's gaze. Malus clenched his fist, fighting the urge to look over his shoulder at his sister and see what passed between them. The general locked stairs with the witch a moment and then lowered his gaze. You, you are right, of course, he grumbled. Now is not the time. My lord is very wise, Nagaira replied, like a mother speaking to a child. Your army awaits, general. Show them Cain's blessing and let the journey begin to Ha Grief, where your crown awaits. Yes, yes, of course, Fuerlan said, gathering up the reins of his querulous mount. The old Nauglier growled and began to walk forward. Malus nudged Spite backwards out of the general's path when the scarred Nagarite kicked his mount savagely and it leapt at Spite. The older cold one bellowed in rage and charged at its smaller kin, but Spite was not one to back down from a challenge. Malus's Nauglier roared in response and snapped its massive jaws in the cold one's face. Malus cursed savagely, hauling at the reins, and Fuerlan did likewise, turning the old war beast's head aside and bringing the two cold ones almost flank to flank for a moment. When they did, the general glared down at Malus, his face twisted with hatred. I've dreamt of this for months, he said, a deranged giggle escaping his lips. Look around you, I have an army waiting on my every command. I don't need to lay a hand on you to destroy you. By the time the campaign is over, you will deliver your precious city into my hands. I'll have you skinned alive and marched in the court of thorns to place the Drakau's crown upon my head. And after you are dead, I'll have your skull turned into a chamber pot. Think on that with the few days left to you. Before Malus could reply, Spite snapped at the old Nauglier's flanks, and the huge beast leapt away, bellowing in rage. Fuerlan cursed and kicked, spilling more of Cain's sacred blood upon the stones. An angry hiss went up from the temple maidens, causing Malus to smile. Nagaira's mount ducked out of the old Nauglier's path, the fierce warhorse taking a nip of its own at the war beast's shoulder. It was several moments before Fuerlan got the animal under control. When he did, he turned the Nauglier to face the household knights, as though nothing had happened. The warriors watched Fuerlan stonily as he stood in the stirrups and cried out in a thin voice. Warriors of the Black Ark! It is I, the bearer of sacred blood, anointed in Cain's cauldron. Fuerlan held aloft the goblet continuing the ritual benediction. Before you, I drink of the Lord of Murder's blessing, 
promising glory and plunder for all those marching beneath my banner. Fuerlan raised the goblet to his lips, and a ragged cheer went up from the knights and the first divisions of foot. Malice watched the general tilt the cup further and further back, until its base pointed into the air. When Fuerlan straightened and raised the cup in triumph, Malice noted that there wasn't even a thin stain of red on his lips. You spilled every drop of holy blood with your stupidity, the highborn thought bitterly. An ill omen indeed. Malice listened at a young general as he began barking orders to set the army on the march. Bale's plan was audacious, but like all daring plans, it was a dangerous gamble. If the army of Hoggrief didn't do as the witch lord predicted in every single particular, they could be heading into disaster. The Autari girl studied him with the dispassionate malevolence of a hunting hawk. Malice ran a gauntleted hand over his face and tried to wipe the dirt off the road and the weight of exhaustion from his eyes. What do you mean there are enemy troops north of the Blackwater Ford? Horses and spears, the girl said in her sweet, dead voice. Many scores of them. She turned and pointed south along the road, beyond the hill in the distance. They gather wood and wait among the broken towers to either side of the road. Malice straightened in the saddle and tried in vain to work the stiffness out of his back. The household knights were stretched along a quarter mile of the spear road, resting their weary mounts in the late afternoon sun. They were half a day past Nagarond. The black spires of Malekith's fortress could still be seen far to the northwest. Blackwater Ford lay another five miles to the south, nestled among a line of low hills and pine forests, running east to west along the line of the rushing river. The past few days had stretched into a blur of cold food and constant travel. The household knights had been ordered to march in the vanguard of the army, along with the first division of foot. Mala suspected this was so, so he would be the first to encounter any trouble along the way. The column paused for fifteen minutes every four hours. Men learned to doze fitfully in their saddles and steal quick meals of hard biscuit washed down with brackish water. The highborn couldn't imagine how the spearmen were keeping up. Even the iron stamina of the Nauglier was wearing thin. They were just a few miles from their intended campsite. According to the plan, the army was to make camp just short of the ford, and rest for a day and a half, while the scouts and the dark riders crossed the river in search of the enemy. Unfortunately, it seemed that the warriors of Hargreave had other plans. Stand, spite, Malus ordered, and an ogler sank eagerly onto the surface of the road. The highborn slid stiffly from the saddle. Face and hands were caked with dust and grime, and his lank hair was pulled back in a simple rawhide strap. Curiously, the runes Nagara had painted on his skin remained as clear and vivid as ever. No amount of rubbing seemed to blur their sharp black lines. The realization left him uneasy. Malice beckoned to the Autari and her companions. He had sent her ahead with the scouts more to keep her out of his hair than anything else. When she was around, she was lurking like a vengeful ghost watching him when she thought he wasn't looking. Nearby, Elofir and Gelfan dismounted as well and joined their lord. Tenukir stayed in the saddle, keeping an eye on the division. Show me, the highborn said, kneeling in the dirt on the side of the road. Draw me a map. The girl sank gracefully into a crouch, drawing a long knife. She gave him a strange look over the point of the blade, and then began scratching lines in the soil. Over the hill yonder, the road passes through fields bordered by woods, she said as she worked. Half a mile ahead, there were ruins to either side of the road, broken towers and fallen statues. The men of the hag wait there, cutting firewood and driving rails into the earth. Rails? Malus echoed, studying the Autari's map. Likely setting picket lines for the horses. Did you see any Nauglir? The dragonkin? the girl said. No, just horses and spears. The highborn nodded thoughtfully. Eluhir drank deeply from a water flask and eyed his lord. What does that mean? he asked. An advance party, Mala said. 
cavalry scouts and foragers sent ahead to establish a camp for the main force, which means the hag's army is crossing the ford as we speak. The highborn studied the map, trying to ignore the dull headache throbbing between his temples. There would be no way to approach the ruins down the road without being seen, and he was sure the advance party would have at least some crossbowmen standing watch. He considered the rough outline of the forests. Are there any decent trails in these woods? There are hunting paths, the girl said with a shrug. We have little need of them. But could the Nogler use them? The girl paused. Yes, she said. Malus studied the map for another few moments, trying to see if there was anything he was missing. If they could strike the enemy while they were crossing the river, they could wreak a terrible slaughter. But they would have to move quickly, and the advance force would have to be defeated first. He checked the map one final time and nodded sharply. All right, he said, rising to his feet. Elufir, mount up and ride back down the road as quick as you can. Fuerlon and the rest of the army should be only a mile or so behind us. Tell him that the army of the hag is crossing the Blackwater right now, and he is to come with all speed. At once, my lord, Elufir said, and ran for his mount. Galefan watched the boy go and turned to Malus. What are we going to do in the meantime? Malus shrugged. The men have been marching non-stop for days, and they have nothing to eat but hard biscuit and water. We've got two banners of foot and a single banner of cold ones. The enemy likely outnumbers us, and has a strong defensive position. He turned to the old knight. What else? We attack. <laughs>